team. I said, if you exist, you got to speak to me and explain this to me. And it was, it was at age 13 that my life was transformed. Because that night at 3 a.m. outside on the dirt ground under the stars in the Bahamas with tears running down my face, I asked God to explain to me why we were poor. His answer was simple. He says, because of your mind. That began a journey for me. I surrendered my life to God that night at age 13. I never went back. At age 14, I wrote on paper everything I wanted to be and to do. Today, I am doing those things. And something happened between sleeping on the floor and flying my own jet today. Now... What happened is I had a mental transformation. Nothing changes until your mind changes. You can change your clothes and still have the whole mind. You can change your location and still have the old mind. You can change your house and still have the old mind. Nothing changes until your mind changes. And during that journey as a young man, I began to read the Bible at age 14. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm serious about this. I read this book at age 14. I read through the entire book, and I didn't understand nothing. Because the Bible is a very complicated book. And also, I read it in the King James Version, which is even worse. And, but I read it because I wanted to know what God said to man. When I was 15 years old, I read the Bible again, completely through. And I began to understand it. By age 16, I began to memorize big chunks of this book. And my, my school lessons went from F to A. I became an A student because of this book. I graduated top of my school in high school because of this book. It taught me that nothing was impossible. So my whole life was changed because I fed myself new information from that book, which changed my concept of me. And I discovered things like this. The greatest tragedy in life is not death. Some people think that when someone dies, that's the worst thing that can happen to you. That's not true. I discovered that the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but it's life without a purpose. It is more tragic to be alive and not know why than to be dead and not know life. Because when you are alive, you've got to explain what you're doing with your hours, with your minutes, with your energy, with your talents, with your time. You've got to explain why am I here and what did I do last week with my life? Most people are living as an experiment. I discovered that there are five questions that everybody must answer to become successful. I discovered these when I was 15 years old. Write them down. The first question every human must answer to become successful are these questions. And every one of you in this room got to deal with these questions. Question number one, who am I? It's a tough question, and some of you think you've answered it, but it's not an easy question to answer. Normally when I ask people who you are, they tell me what they do. I didn't ask you what you did. I ask people, who are you? They say, I'm a nurse. I didn't ask you what you did. I want to know who are you. How do you identify yourself? You shouldn't confuse yourself with your career. Your career is temporary. That means when you lose your job, then you lose your life. Who are you? Second question you must answer is, where am I from? Very important question. It's a tough question. As a matter of fact, humans have been trying to answer these questions for over two, three thousand 3,000 years. Today, they have been even attempting to say that you are from monkeys. Uh, they talk about evolution. They talk about man starting 
as a, a slime that became a salamander that became a tadpole that developed into a frog which became a, eventually an ape man that became a human. Well, I don't know about you, but I ain't no ape and I ain't no tadpole. But they try to explain that you came from some big bang that caused some genetic coding in the slime, in the, in the abyss of six billion years ago, all this stuff they talk about. They're trying to explain where you're from. You see, until you know where you're from, you don't know who you are. What is your source? Where did you come from? It's a very important question. And the third question I had to answer and grapple with is why am I here? That's a tough question. Why were you born? Why were you conceived? Why are you on this planet right now? Why did you come to earth? These are tough questions. And the person sitting behind you have not yet answered that question. Because it's a hard question. We don't even like to think about it. Why am I here? We, we, we ask that question silently. We don't talk about it publicly much. Because we are afraid we don't know the answer. Why were you born? I mean, they said when a man has sex with a woman and he releases semen into a woman, scientists have proven that over 600 million sperms rush toward the egg. And only one makes it. And guess who that was? And my question is, why did 599 million sperms die so that you could live to come to this planet? Was there a reason why the divine creator chose that specific sperm for you to come at this time. Why did you come here? It's a tough question. You didn't come here just to make a living and pay bills and then die? You didn't come just to make a living. You came here to make a difference. You came to deliver something that we're supposed to have. We got to find out what that is. You're not a mistake. You are not a biological accident. So why did you come here? It's a tough question. The fourth question everybody must answer is, what can I do? What is my true ability? And this is a tough question because most of the people in this church sitting here today are living below their true potential. You don't know what you're capable of. Why? Because we have accepted other people's opinions of our own ability. We've allowed people and culture and society tell us what we can and cannot do. I was a victim of that years ago. I had to be delivered from people. Even living in this city, in this town right here, could be your greatest curse. Because there are certain things they don't expect you to do in this town. They tell you how far you can go, what you cannot do, what's never been done, and you better don't, don't upset the boat and, and don't achieve that here, and you can't do that here. They, they muffle your true ability. What can you do is the question. It's a tough question. And the fifth question, write it down, everyone must answer, is where am I going? This one has to do with your destiny. Where are you going in your life? Where will you be in the next 10 years? What do you see for the next 50 years of your life? What do you want to do with yourself in the next 40 years? What do you see in your life as your future destiny? What's your hope to become and to do in your life? Or are you simply waiting for the next paycheck? Is your life as short as the next bill you pay? Is there a sense of destiny in your life? God sent me here to talk to you to let you know that you are not just here as a passing fantasy. You came to this planet because something that you need to do is still undone. Tell your neighbor, I am loaded. Say it again, I am loaded. Say it again, I am loaded. He'll be okay. Just keep looking at me, please. Write this down, please. Very important. You were created to live life with meaning and purpose. You are not a mistake. As a matter of fact, until you discover your personal reason for living, you will never be fulfilled. You were born, sir, to do something important in this world. That's why I am convinced that all of us were created for a purpose, equipped with potential and designed for a destiny. I am convinced that you are loaded with stuff that we haven't seen yet. 
and is trapped under your fear of people. As a matter of fact, some of your greatest graveyards are your jobs. Nothing can bury you faster than a career that you're trapped in. You were born to do something that the world needs. And that's why until you discover your purpose, you can never maximize your potential. I'm going to explain that to you in a few minutes before we go. Your purpose, madam, is the most important thing for you to discover. Because when you find your purpose, you automatically find your potential. And when you find your purpose and potential, you become unstoppable. No human opinion can touch you when you discover your purpose in life. Oh, I'm about to shout all by myself. This is why you and I had to meet tonight. I had to fly all day from my country to come here because God is saying, I'm going to fix you this year. I'm going to break free this year. I'm going to open you up this year. This year you are going to launch into things you never thought you could do. This year is your year of breaking out. Say breaking out. Say it loud. As we drove here from the airport to the town this afternoon, I saw something that always stirs me. And it makes me ask a question I asked when I was 17 years old. I asked this question. What is the wealthiest spot on planet Earth? Where is the greatest wealth on Earth? And someone says, well, maybe it is the gold mines of South America, or it's the diamond mines of South Africa, or the oil fields of Iran, Iraq, and Kuwait, or maybe it is the silver mines of Peru, or maybe it's the oceans of the Caribbean with all that seafood. What is the wealthiest spot on Earth? I found it. The wealthiest spot on Earth is right here in Marion. I saw it today. The wealthy spot on earth looks just like this. It's the cemetery. Why is the cemetery the wealthy spot on earth? Do you know why? Because buried in the cemetery are books that were never written. In the graveyard, we've got paintings that were never painted. Buried in the cemetery right here in Marion is music that no one has ever heard. Because people died with music in their minds. What a tragedy. The graveyard is filled with businesses that never opened. Some of you had a business idea for the last 20 years and you are still employed. Because you wouldn't step out and believe God with that idea. And the cemetery is going to take that business from us. The graveyard is filled with ideas that never became reality. The graveyard is filled with visions that died as nightmares and dreams. We got plans that were never executed. The graveyard is filled with awesome, powerful treasure no one has ever used. As a matter of fact, that is why I came here. Because I had to come. I came here because of the cemetery. I came here because I knew sitting in your chair right now tonight would be a person who is the candidate to add to the wealth of the cemetery. You are about to make the cemetery even more wealthy. Why? Because trapped in you is a book that you are procrastinating on. Inside of you is an idea that you still refuse to pursue. Inside of you is music that you never wrote, poetry you never wrote. How come the cemetery is going to take from us again? I have come to make sure the cemetery doesn't get anything from you. I really came here to Marion, South Carolina, to make sure that you die empty. Yeah. You came to earth to go back to God empty. I came here to make sure that the graveyard gets nothing but an empty carcass. I came here to make sure that when you die, you will die like Jesus Christ who says, it is finished. Listen to me. He didn't die old. 
He was 33 years old when he died. That's young. But to him, he was finished. That means you ain't supposed to die old. You're supposed to die finished. But you can't finish if you don't know what to start. Life is not measured by how old you are. It's measured by how much you got left. You're supposed to die like the Apostle Paul. Paul says, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have been poured out like a drink offering. There's nothing else left, he says. I am now ready to die. You should die not because you're sick and old, but because you ain't got nothing left to do. Give God a hand for dying empty. The graveyard is filled with wealth. This is why God sent me here, because you are getting closer to the graveyard, and you are still loaded. I wonder, what do you call this wealth in the cemetery? Well, I found out what it is. Write it down. The wealth in the cemetery is called potential. What is it called? Say it loud. Potential. One more time. Potential. Say it louder. Potential. This word is very important to God. Everybody say potential again. Potential. This word is intimate with God. And we don't understand the word. We've missed it. What changed my life from sleeping on the floor to running a multi-million dollar organization around the world today in 89 countries is because I discovered this one word. When I discovered it, everything changed. Hallelujah. I'm about to give you my secret. Everybody say potential. potential. The graveyard is packed with potential. What is potential? Write this down. First of all, potential is dormant ability. Dormant ability. Secondly, potential is untapped power. Untapped power. Thirdly, potential is hidden strength. Strength that is hidden away. Fourthly, potential is reserved energy. Like the car battery. In your car is a whole lot of power in that battery, but it is hidden away. It is dormant. It is buried. In other words, potential is kept capacity. When your capacity is being kept and no one lets it out. Potential is unused success. Potential is also unleashed talent. Why is this choir still singing other people's songs? When you can write your own songs for other people to sing. There is music in this choir trapped inside of you. Will the graveyard get that? Marvin Sapp is not the only one that can write a song. You can write a song. You can produce music. You can change the world with your music. But you got to understand it's trapped. Potential is all you can do, but you haven't done yet. Potential is all you can become, but you haven't become it yet. Potential is a very strange concept. Potential is who you really are, but no one knows it yet. Hallelujah. I'm going to make a statement. Don't ever forget it. Every person write it down. Whatever you have done is no longer your potential. Whatever you have what? Done is no longer your potential. Potential is always what you haven't done yet, but you can still do. In other words, potential is the you that nobody knows yet. We already know the one you showed us. As a matter of fact, the greatness you are still to attain is trapped on the inside. Potential, therefore, is what you can accomplish but you haven't achieved yet. That's why I come to this church to talk to this church also. 18 years, God has said, well, okay. You built this building five years ago. 
You have a beautiful structure. Well, thank God. But God is bored. Listen to me carefully. Potential is never what you've done. Because once you've done something, it ceases to be your potential. Potential is always what's left that you haven't done yet. Potential is always hidden. God is a God of potential. He always goes after what you haven't done yet. He is bored in what you've done. Once you've done something, it's over. Potential, therefore, is always what's left that you haven't done yet. And God always is motivated by potential. Why? Because God knows what he put inside you. This building, 18 years later, is not the one God showed you. Am I right? Yes, sir. This is just a stop on the way to another stage. And God has said, okay, stop here, put up a pillar, call it Ebenezer, but keep moving. See, we are so attracted to our own success. We begin to worship our own success. As a matter of fact, write this down. The greatest enemy of progress is your last success. I'm going to say it again. The greatest enemy of your progress is your last success. Say it with me. The greatest enemy of my progress is what? My last success. That means nothing can stop you from growing like success. You can become so proud of what you've done that you stop doing what you could do. You see... Potential is never what you've done because once you've done it, it's no longer your potential. Potential is always hidden. It demands that you never settle for what you have accomplished. Take a photograph of this building, come in here and worship every week, fine, but ask God, okay, what's next? He said, build a school and build a radio station and build a TV station and build a youth center and build a children's school and build an old folks' home. In other words, he never stops. Oh, I hope you hear me. You are not supposed to die on the job you have. God's too creative to make you die in a career. Oh, I'm talking to myself. You all ain't ready for me. He never stops. He's, he is always going after potential. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, write this down. The greatest enemy of your potential is what? Your last success. Don't ever trust what you've achieved. It will trap you. I remember Peter, James, and John was taken up on a mountain by Jesus Christ. They was meeting with, Joe, with Moses and Elijah. And they saw him in his original state. He began to glow. The Bible says God is like so when Christ <laughs> showed his true self through his skin and they saw the light, bright as the sun, brighter than the sun, Peter and James and John found their faces and they were so overwhelmed. They saw something they never saw before. And they said, let's stay right here. Let's build three houses and just stay up here. That's how we are. We like to stay where God does stuff. Write this down. Don't ever get caught where God used to be. Some of your testimonies are so old, God is tired of them. I don't want to hear what he did in 1954. I'm sick of that. Give me something he did last night. God is too creative to repeat himself. That's why he never 
duplicated a miracle in the Bible, not once. God never repeated a miracle in the Bible, never. Why? He's too creative. He's a God of potential. This ministry has done this. Well, good. It's done. It's no longer your potential. There's a church inside this church now. Another one. Oh, you don't understand what I'm talking about. This is why potential is never finished. Say with me, potential is never finished. I'm about to send you home shouting with a revelation that's going to keep you up all night. Are you ready for this? Are you sure? Write the word omni down. O-M-N-I. It's a word you never saw before. Omni. O-M-N-I. The word omni, I saw it on a saw in Carolina, North Carolina the other day. The word omni means all. It means entire. It means always all. It means complete or total. Everybody say omni. omni. Say it loud. Omni. omni. Good. Say it again. Omni. omni. Get used to this word. It's an important word to you. Now, there's another word to write down. It's the word potent. The word potent, P-O-T-E-N-T, is the word which means power. It means might, energy, strength. It means force. Everybody say potent. potent. Say it again. Potent. It means power. It means might. It means strength. It means energy. Now take the word omni and put it next to the word potent. And you should have a new word that you probably heard before. How do you pronounce that? I can't hear you. Omnipotent. Omnipotent. Everybody say omnipotent. There's only one person that name is ascribed to. Who's that? Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shiskanu, God himself. He is what? Omnipotent. Omnipotent means all potential. Oh, I'm getting ready to talk to myself. God is not only the God of potential. He is potential. He is all power. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Do you know what that means? Listen to me carefully. That means that God says he himself is omnipotent. That means he is all potential. He is always full of potential. No, you don't hear what I'm saying. That means what God has done already. He spit out of his mouth with his word 500 million galaxies. He made Milky Ways and he made solar systems. He made all the eons of space and black holes. He made all these millions of planets. And then God made a solar system with one sun and three planets from the sun. He called it Earth. And he made uh, rivers and, and forests and birds and bees and fish and animals and beautiful stuff. And God says, this is good. And then God made all this powerful universe. And God says, I am still omnipotent. That means you ain't seen nothing yet. Come on, give him a big praise for being omnipotent. Omnipotent means I am still loaded. Oh Lord, have mercy. When you walk outside, look at the stars. The millions of stars. God says, you ain't seen nothing yet. I haven't shown you everything on the inside of me. As a matter of fact, here's the mystery. Before anything was, God is. That means everything that is, was inside of God. Because there was a time when there was nothing but God. So if you meant God when there was nothing, you'd meet God standing on nothing by the corner of nowhere, full with everything. Everything was made by him, the Bible says. That means before he made anything, everything was inside of him. 
and therefore he released everything out of him when he was standing on nothing by the corner of nowhere. Here's the beauty of being full of potential. That means if you meant God before anything was on the corner of nowhere by the corner of no nothing and you shook his hands, you'd be shaking hands with everything but wouldn't have known you'd be shaking hands with everything. Oh, you don't hear what I've said. In other words, potential is always hidden on the inside. That's why you got to be careful how you treat people. You don't know what they're carrying. Oh, I'm talking to myself tonight. Tell your neighbor, be nice to me. You don't know what I'm carrying. Hey, where's the potential? Say it again, potential. Say it again, potential. Say it again, potential. That's why you should never judge a person by looking at them. He is omnipotent. That means he is all powerful, almighty. He is all strength. He is still full of stuff you haven't seen yet. That's why God never panics. If he can't find something, he'll go inside and bring it out. Oh, glory, hallelujah. God has never stopped creating. What he needs, if he doesn't have it, he'll produce it. That's why you should go to sleep tonight. Don't worry about tomorrow. He got everything covered. Whatever you need, he'll make it if he have to. He is omnipotent. Shout amen, somebody. Come on, give him praise. Ah! He's omnipotent, son. That word is not a religious word. It's a description of his reality. In other words, omnipotent means that God is still able to do more than he has done. You think this building is nice? Wait till you see the next one he gonna put up right here. Somebody ought to shout loud. Shaburamuka. I'm trying to be nice tonight. Ha! <laughs> Tell your neighbor, be careful. You don't know who you're sitting next to. You don't know what I'm carrying. I'm loaded. Clap your hands, all your people. Shout! They don't know who you are, son. Oh, I'm getting ready to shout again. He is almighty. He is omnipotent. Look at Genesis 17 verse 1. It says, when Abraham was 90 years old. Ooh, sound like some of y'all. It says, the Lord appeared to him when he was what? 90. And God introduced himself with a word. Now you see, he knows the guy is 90 and can't have children. And his wife is barren. No, no, you didn't hear what I said. God already know what you think you cannot do. <laughs> so God said, Abraham, before you say anything, let me say who I am. I am what? God all potential. Oh, Lord have mercy. Now, when before we do business, let me tell you who I am. I can do anything I say you should do. Now I can say it again. I can do anything I say you should do. Still didn't get what I said. <laughs> I can do anything I say you should do. So let me tell you who I am. I am almighty. Now let's talk, he says. God will never tell you to do anything that isn't already done. This building is an old building. God finally found somebody dumb enough to believe it's possible. Ha! He is Alpha and Omega. He is finished. God is trying to find people 
who will start things that are already finished. I am almighty Abraham. Now let's talk. I am all potential. Look at Isaiah 14 verse 26. God says, this is the plan I determined for the whole world. This is the hand stretched out over all nations. For the Lord Almighty has purpose. And who can stop him? His hand is stretched out. And who can turn it back? Listen, I am almighty. Let me explain what that means in Hebrew. Almighty means all potential. All energy. All powers. I have all of them under my control. That means nothing can stop you. And if it thinks it's stopping you, God's allowing it to do something for you until it's finished doing what it's supposed to do. It can't stop you. If he's almighty, then that means no might is not under his control. If you think you lost your job, he sent me to tell you, mm -mm, that was a setup. Start your own business now. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh! He is almighty. Let me give you this before we go. Where does potential come from? Write this down. Very important list, everyone. Number one, God is potential. He's omnipotent. Number two, God is the source of potential. That means every power comes out of God. Number three, God is a God of potential. That means he does nothing without potential principle. Number four, everything was created with potential principle. Everything that God created he put in it potential principle. This is the biggest thing I'm going to give you for tonight, all right? Write this down. Number five, everything possesses potential. How many things? Everything. everything. How many things? Everything. Please don't miss this. This is what got me delivered at age 17. Everything God created possessed potential. At least in number six, potential is a product of purpose. Oh, I, mean, I need to be here two more weeks just to talk about that. Purpose is why a thing exists. Potential is its ability to perform it. So when God makes a thing for a purpose, he puts in it its own potential. So potential is a product of purpose. That leads to number seven. Potential precedes purpose. In other words, God will never demand from something what he didn't put in it. Do you understand what I just said, sir? So when God tells someone to do something, it's because he put the do in it. No, you still ain't got it yet. This is why when God commands to do something, excuse is impossible. Let me, let me, let me drive this on before we go. I discovered that God does nothing without potential principle. That means whatever God created, he built it with potential in it. Let me give you a verse to remember. Genesis 1, verse 12. This is the first place God introduced potential. Now, get ready. You're about to change right before someone's eyes. God created the universe, created the planets, created our solar system, created the earth, and then he started in Genesis 1 putting stuff on the earth. Now, listen carefully, because when I see you again, you'll be a different person. God is about to show us how everything is made. Verse 11, Genesis chapter 1, it says, And the earth brought forth grass, and herd and yields 
seed according to its kind. And the tree that yields the fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. Now, this is too complicated for you. Let me break it down. When I went to university, I got three bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, and four doctorates. I'm not a dumb man, okay? I took a course in Hebrew at university, or Arab University. When I did my course in Hebrew and in Greek, I was shocked to discover that most of the stuff we read in English don't make sense. The Bible was written in Hebrew, not English. Old Testament. In the Hebrew language, here's the way this is written. It says, and the Lord God made the trees and the plants, and he hid in them their own seed. It says, and God placed the seed of everything in itself. Now read my lips. God placed the seed of everything in itself. Let me say it over here because you all don't understand what I'm talking about. It says, and God placed the seed of everything inside itself. The Hebrew context means whatever God wants a thing to become, he hides it in the thing. Oh, I'm getting ready to run right across there. In other words, God takes everything a thing is supposed to become and put it inside the thing and he gives you the thing with everything in it. <coughs> you didn't get that yet. This is the key to your future. God, therefore, Finishes everything first. Oh, getting ready to go home now. Oh, you got to get this, please. Some of y'all still don't believe me. God finishes everything first. And then he takes the finish and puts it in the start. That's what that means. He calls it seed. Even Jesus said, I am a seed. If you plant me in the ground, I will bring forth millions. Listen to me. And we're going to go, oh Lord. God says, you see this here? God says, look. He says, I put the seed of everything in itself. He says, everything is in a seed. God does not give trees. He that giveth seed. Tell your neighbor, you don't know what I am. And he gave me to you. Yes, sir. God doesn't give adults. He hides them in children. In, <laughs> Come here. I want to show you something. Don't forget this. Are you all ready for me? All right. God, today we got 6.7 billion humans on earth right now 6.7 billion God only made one yeah. oh, uh, listen to me now God went to the soil and made one and God blew in to one now remember, God don't start until he's already finished. So God started, which means he was already finished. You see, God finished with everybody first. He made everybody first and then took everybody and put them in one body. So Adam was everybody in one body that's the seed 
So in the garden, when God was talking to Noah, I mean to Adam rather, he was talking to everybody in one body. So God told everybody in one body, don't touch the tree. If you shook hands with Adam, you'd be shaking hands with everybody. You wouldn't have known it because everybody was in that one body. And whatever that one body does, everybody does. That's why the Bible says by one man, sin entered into the whole world and was passed upon all men because everybody was in that one body. Everybody said potential. Adam was loaded. When God finished all the instructions, then God didn't go outside to find a female. He went inside the brother. Pulled out. Come on, somebody. She was already in there. Everybody said potential. potential. That means everybody was in the one body. This is why Jesus Christ didn't need a million bodies to die. Because when he came, he had Adam. He was the last Adam. He had Adam inside of him. He had everybody inside his body. So by one man sin entered, by one man all was saved. But come on, somebody. Thank you very much, Adam. Now, follow me. You're gonna go, follow me. So that means when God has a seed, here's what God says. I put the seed of everything inside the seed. It's called potential. So in every seed, I have a seed, here's a seed. I ask you, what do you see? Okay, this is an apple seed. What do you see? You say, I see an apple seed. Well, that's a fact, but it's not the truth. Because what I have in my hand is not an apple seed. I have an apple tree. But that's not the truth either. Because in that seed is an apple tree with apples. But that ain't quite the truth yet. Because in that seed is an apple tree that has apples, that are seeds. And those seeds in the apple get trees. But that ain't true either. Because in that seed, there's an apple tree that has apples that have seeds that have trees. And those trees get apples that have seeds that have trees that have fruit that have seeds with trees with fruit that have seeds with trees with fruit that have apples with seeds with trees that have fruit that have seeds that have trees that have fruit. And those fruit get seeds with seeds with trees that have fruit that have seeds that have trees that have fruit that have seeds that have trees with fruit with seeds. And those seeds got trees that have fruit, that have seeds, that have trees, that have fruit. What did God do here? In my hand, you see an apple seed. That's a fact. But the truth is, I have a forest. Tell your neighbor, it's a fact right now that I'm broke. But the truth is, I'm loaded. Give God a hand for potential. Your son today is an alcoholic. God says, no, that's just a fact. The truth is, he's going to be a great preacher in Mario. God can look at a murderer and see inside the murderer. Now the fact is he's a murderer. That's a fact. But the truth is inside of him is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Inside a murderer. The next time you read the book of Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus, you're reading the writings of a murderer. Only God look at a murderer and see a deliverer. The Ten Commandments, the laws of God inside a murderer. Everybody say potential. 
That means none of your mistakes can cancel what you carry in. Come on, scream, say amen. Only God could look at a shepherd boy and see a king on the inside. Only God could look at a prostitute named Rahab and see the lineage of Jesus Christ inside a prostitute. Only God could look at a shepherd boy in the wilderness and see the leader of a country. Only God could look at a serial killer named Saul and see Genesis coming true in the New Testament. Inside that serial killer, he said, First and Corinthians, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, he saw the New Testament in a serial killer. I wonder what he's seeing tonight, looking down on this building. He never sees what you've done. He sees what you are carrying. And you are carrying awesome treasure. Let no one cancel your future with their words. Tell your neighbor, I am who he says I am. I can do what he says I can do. If I see it, it's already done. And I'm going to my destiny. I am full of potential. Give God a big scream and shout for a second. I want you to understand tonight that he knew you'd be here and he knew that you hit a brick wall your life has stopped and he has sent this word to tell this church and to tell you visitors you ain't seen nothing yet <laughs> Oh, come on, give him glory. Come on, give him praise. Oh, come on, give him glory. Oh, stand up on your feet and give him worship. Mr. Mayor, what are you dreaming? That's the question. What, are you, what is he showing you when you was a child? Being a mayor is nothing. Why? It's done. Now I'll go be governor. Do something else. Dream big! This is why the word retirement does not exist in the Bible. Don't get quiet on me now. It's not in the Bible. You don't retire. You empty yourself and then you leave. God called Abraham at 75 years old. He got started at 75. What's your problem? Tell your neighbor, you ain't seen nothing yet. Tell your neighbor, no retirement. Refirement. Come on, get that fire back. Give God a praise. You got to get that fire back in your bones, brother. Hallelujah. Let's hold hands together. Take your neighbor's hands on your right and left. Tell your neighbor, I'm loaded. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, you don't know who I am yet. Keep holding that hand. I want to pray for you. Our organization is in over 100 countries in 30 years. We are worth millions of dollars. Started with nothing but an idea. Potential. My first employee in the company and in our organization was my eldest sister. 11 children. She's my she's eldest sister. Eldest one in the family. When I was born, she told me that I was born with asthma. 
And she and mom told me stories how I literally died many times, choking in that wooden crib. And that how she would get up every night when she heard me choking, she would pick me up out of that dirty wooden crib, put me on her shoulder. And my sister said she would walk that wooden floor, not sleeping. Because she knew if she'd lie me down, I would turn blue again and die. And for months, she says, every night she would get up to make sure I didn't die. You know, today, my eldest sister is my administrative assistant. I pay her salary. And she and I were talking in the office a couple of months ago again, and, and she was reminding me. She says, you are all over the world on television. You have books in 89 countries, 30 languages, offices in 17 nations, millions of people being impacted by you all over the world. She said, I remember walking up and down with you, saving you from death. And I said to her, isn't that amazing? You didn't know all those nights you had your boss in your hand. Tell your neighbor, be careful with that hand. Be careful with that hand. I could be your next boss. You don't know anybody in this room. You don't know who is in this room. Stop canceling people. Don't throw your children away. Don't throw members away who fall. You don't know what they're carrying. This is why God loves the garbage dump. Every time society throws someone away, God catches them. Because he knows what he put inside of you. He died to protect the treasure that you carry. We have this treasure in earthen vessels to show forth the glory. My sister had no idea. Not only would I pay her salary, but her husband is my financial vice president. Her daughter works in my mentorship department. Her second daughter works in my television department. I pay the salary of all of her family. She was carrying that in her hand every night didn't know what she was carrying. Tell your neighbor, be nice to me. You don't know. Hallelujah. You are not finished yet. There are books inside of you. The job you have is not where you will die. You are as big as your dreams, not as big as Maria. Believe what he showed you. Don't give up, son. Don't go to school for their sake. Go to school for your own sake. Study for your dreams. Eighteen years. It's okay. You done okay. I'm coming back at thirty-six. You will not be in this room. This will be too small. This will be a children's church. Can you see? All you pastors, God sent you here. Because you think that the building you're in is the permanent address. But God says it's your temporary residence. God sent me here, you young people, 
Because you figured you can't go any further. And God says, I'm sending you a word. Follow your dream, not your culture. The Holy Spirit has already finished you. The fact that you were born is evidence that there's something already finished that you were born to start. And this is why, and listen carefully as I close, Jesus did not die 2,000 years ago. <laughs> he came to start dying 2,000 years ago. The Bible says he was dead. He was slain before I rest my case. God was finished. God saved you before you sinned. Oh, come on, give him glory. Come on, give him glory. I said give him praise. Finish. And that's why he's here tonight to tell you what you saw when you was 14 is still true. What you saw when you was 20 is still true. What you saw when you was 29 is still true. So dust off yourself. Get back up. And put your vision back in place. And when you go to work tomorrow, tell them, I'm going to my preoccupation. This is my temporary employment. This is not what I saw. For the joy that was set before him, he could endure the low salary and the abuse and the misunderstanding for the joy that was set before he had already seen the end let's hold hands together again something's happening here don't you feel that on the inside? Your childhood dreams are coming back. Do you know why, ma'am? Because he said when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, he didn't come for you to fall on the ground. He came so the old men could get their dreams back. And the young men shall get their visions back. And the handmaidens shall see prophetic sight. He comes to give you back the dream that you lost. Hallelujah. Thank you. It's the Holy Spirit. This year, preach the next 10 years. Tell them what you see. Oh man, get your dream back. Get your dream back. Your body is not your limitation. Your brain is still working. Young man, get your vision back. Go back, get your vision. Don't get a job. They can fire you from that. Get a vision. Young woman, see your future and put it on paper. And believe what you write. And the Holy Spirit shall come upon all men. And the young shall see visions again. And the old shall get dreams again. They will see their end. Marion is about to explode. Yeah.
new businesses, new churches, new companies, new investments, new ideas, books and music and publishing and magazines coming out of Marion, going around the world. God says, I'm going to change the world right from here. Can you believe it? Believe your dreams and let no adult talk you out of them. Believe your dreams. When I was 14 years old, I wrote on paper, I will build buildings. I will fly my own jet. I will speak to millions. I will be on TV. I will write books. I was 14. And my family said, are you crazy? And I said, this is what I saw. You should see what else I saw. Next week, I'll be with the government of Curacao training the entire government. Week after that, the government of Aruba, training the entire government, including the president and the prime ministers, in my seminars. That's what I saw. It's happening right now. God begins you with nothing, so he could be everything. You are not what you have. You are what you saw. So go dream again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the hand that we're touching is loaded. Forgive us for assuming we know them. Forgive us for thinking that we understand them. Oh God, forgive us for being reckless with our love. Forgive us for having prejudice and racism and all the stuff that breaks these barriers. Lord, we pray we will see the gift that's in every one of us. Help us to cherish the potential on the inside. Help us to protect each other. May we never act in any way that will destroy our potential. Protect our friendships, Lord. I pray you release right now the spirit of revelation in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, stop every dream, stop every gift, stop every vision in everyone here, Lord. As we agree in faith, stop our gifts. Restore our visions. Help us to believe what you say, Lord. Not what people think. Deliver us from people that we may fulfill your purpose. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this week. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, feel that anointing in your stomach. Let that dream come back to life. Restore what has been taken away from you. Get your vision back. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. 
Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or... Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and I want you to write in your notes, Rediscovering God's Priority, Kingdom First. This is part two. We started part one last week, and this is part two. Understanding God's priority. Kingdom first. I want to begin this morning and pick up where we left off last week by defining what priority is. So you might want to write this down somewhere in your notes on the back of your Bible what is priority and the word priority is important because it has to do with our focus today and next week we will continue this talking about what is God's priority a priority is first of all defined as the principal thing the principal thing secondly priority is defined as putting the first thing first Putting the first thing first. Thirdly, priority is defined as establishing what is most important. What is most important. And fourthly, the word priority is defined as primary focus. Whatever you consider to be your primary focus would become your priority. And fifth, Priority is defined as placing things in order of importance. Priority usually is a result of many possibilities. Priority is a result of many alternatives. Priority is necessary because there are so many other things. So priority is usually a choice among many. At least the number six. Priority is defined as placing the highest value and worth upon something. Priority is placing the highest worth or the highest value on something. That becomes your priority. That is why somebody would perhaps buy a Nike shoe for 150 bucks but they would put fifty dollars in the offering number seven priority is defined as first among others priority usually demands that something else become second or third number seven priority is defined as the most critical the most critical and I want to focus on what happens when you don't have priority and why God is saying to us in this ministry and to our worldwide network and the millions who are watching us around the world today God is telling us I want you to get my priority back what happens when you don't have a priority? Number one, you waste time and energy on the wrong thing. Number two, when your priorities are out of order, you are busy on the wrong thing. That's why busyness is not a sign of progress. Because you can be very busy doing the wrong thing all your life. Number three, when there's an absence of priority, you major on the unimportant. When I think about the religious world, especially when you talk about the Christian world, it's a busy religion always doing things 
We got schools that study our theology. They call them seminaries. Because something is studied does not mean it's important. <laughs> Number four, when there's an absence of priority, you end up doing the unnecessary. And number five, when there is an absence of priority, you are preoccupied with the unimportant. Some people are so committed to doing the unnecessary, they would fight to defend it. The older you grow, the more you become aware of the unnecessary. <laughs> when you hit 50, you become nervous. Because all of a sudden you realize you ain't got more than about 25 years left and you might lose five of them with cancer or something. Is what you're doing necessary? Number six, where there is no priority set, you invest in the less valuable that means you invest your money your time your gifts your talents in the wrong thing priority protects you from bad investment of your life number seven where there's an absence of priority write this down please you suffer from ineffective activity and number eight where there is no priority set in your life, there's an abuse of gifts and talents. Number nine, where there is no priority, you forfeit purpose. In other words, you end up not doing what you were created to do or born to do. You end up missing that. You forfeit your purpose for your life. And finally, number 10, where there is no priority, and please write these down and teach these to your children because if your young people learn priority you won't have disciplined them too much number 10 when there is no priority set in your life your result is failure I don't think there's anything worse than being successful completing the wrong assignment So doing a good job is really not a sign of success. Because you could do a good job on the wrong thing. How long has the church been in existence as we know it? 2,000 years. What have the church been doing? Well, you should, you should study church history. I had to do it in class. And we had to study from the first century all the way up to the 20th century in class. We went through the whole 2,000 years. And it's amazing what the church was busy doing. And there's more sinners in the world, more confusion in the world, more wars in the world, more corruption in the world, more drugs in the world, what have we been doing? Priority. I want to talk about something now that's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but you're going to get a revelation. Please write this down. Religions of needs. I have heard from the Lord. Praise God. All religions are built on the promise of meeting needs all buddhism hinduism confucianism baha'i scientology humanism animism and islam and christianity all religions are built on the promise of meeting needs. This is one of the most important statements I'm going to make. 
That is why most people join a religion. You're sitting next to one. Not you, I'm talking to the one behind you. 99% of the people who follow a religion, whether it's Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Shintoism, Scientology, whatever it is, even Christianity, they follow it because the religion promise to meet some need they feel they have. Number two then becomes important. And that is all religions are motivated by the pleasing of a deity in order <laughs> to secure basic needs. And this is very important. All religions are motivated by the, the need to please a deity in hopes that the deity would meet some needs in their life. Let me give you a couple of examples. I have some words here. I want to write these words down. Crops. When you study religions, most religions, especially those who are from the kind of a natural religions, most of them are motivated by pleasing gods, G-O-D-S, gods, in order for the gods to be nice to them so that their crops could grow. Then you got religions who would worship their gods so they can have good weather so that they won't have any hurricanes or tycoons or typhoons or you know tidal waves or tsunamis in other words we we worship our god or gods to have so that they can be nice to us and give us good weather that's the need we have thirdly people worship god for protection that's why you see them hanging little dolls all over the place and sprinkling salt around the door. Of course, you all don't do that here in your country. Uh, turning the Bible right upside down, all this stuff. In other words, we, we, we use our deities for protection. It's a need we have. Religion does that. Then we serve our gods so that we can have preservation. He can preserve us from our enemies. And, you know, if a tribe attacks us, you know, we would sacrifice a baby so that the tribe won't destroy us so we kill our own baby these are religious acts and most religions serve their gods and they're motivated by the need for them to have their gods favor so the Hindus would put food outside in the night to feed the gods the Muslims would turn toward the East and pray four five six seven times a day in order to appease their god so that their god could preserve them the buddhists would hit the little bell ding and burn incense and they would chant quotes so the gods would be nice so that their rice crops would grow it's religion religion is motivated by needs And then Christians, they do a lot of things to appease their God, just like the Jews do in Judaism. We, we kind of, you know, we give to get, we pray to impress him, sometimes we pray loud to make sure we impress him. One time Jesus said to the Pharisees, you think you'll be heard because of your much speaking? We do all these things. We, we meet maybe once, twice, three times a week just to make sure God's not mad at us so that he can be nice to us. We are no better than the Buddhists. Why? Because someone said if you meet and you pray and you sing some songs, God will pay your bills. So we are no better than the Hindus. Needs. Write this down. All religions, their primary focus is on the needs of the worshiper. That's why many of you may have come here today. Not all, but some of you may have come here because you got some problems and you figure if I go to that place and, you know, do some things, uh, I'll get my problem solved. And so you really didn't come here to worship God. You came here to worship him so you can get something. 
you're not too interested in his needs and you may even be as bold enough to say he doesn't have any our motivation and what we do is usually motivated by needs I was among that kind of people I used to be serving God doing things you know fasting and pray because I wanted to you know get the deity to be happy so that he could be nice to me it's religion it's more concerned about the worshiper I'll well, write this down religious priority in petition and prayers is for personal needs religious priority in what petition and prayers is usually what the needs that you have personally in other words most of our prayers sound like this Lord I love you I praise you now listen here's my list so our prayer lives are usually a grocery list of our needs see I told you we're no different from the others if you listen to the typical prayer of a human especially and even maybe more so the Christian worshiper 90% or more of their prayer is asking God to meet a need I need food I need clothing my kids need lunch God I need rent payment and it's getting close God hurry mortgage payment is behind two payments Lord come on Lord, my business is going in the black. Come on now, Jesus. And I'm coming to church now because they're about to take my car back. And so we are motivated. Even our prayers are nothing but a list of needs, requests. I tell you, religion is really motivated by needs. I write this last part down. Religion is driven by the priority of needs why are you afraid to sin because you God might not pay your bills well that doesn't work with God think about it he said he sends his rain on the just and the unjust so whether you pay whether you you don't sin or not God will still pay your bills <laughs> he sends his rain on the just and the unjust that means he provides for the sinner and the saved so if he was motivated by whether you were saved or unsaved then the saved would be broke but in reality it looked like the saved got more money than you I and mean, the unsaved got more money than you most of you work for the unsaved are you confused yet see our motivation is not God himself is what God could give us so what do we got to do well let me give you a, a little list to write down and this is an important list I want to expose what I call the priority of man what is humans priorities when I was in college in university we studied psychology it's one of my courses I had to study and in psychology, and those of you who are psychologists or those who study psychology or the social sciences, I'm sure you remember this. One of the first books they made us read contained a study and also a theory that was called Maslow's Theory of Need or Hierarchy of Need. Remember that? How many of you remember that? Let me see your hands. Oh, good. Boy, we got, I'm glad you're here. Praise God. Got a lot of folks who, okay. It's an important uh, theory that came out some years ago and uh, Maslow did a research and he studied human behavior he studied what motivated humans what made them do what they do and it was, a, it was a very important study matter of fact I like the study because it proved some things that Jesus said but here's what Maslow was trying to deal with he was trying to expose what are the basic human drives that make a human act what motivates you? What motivates the person sitting next to you? What makes them do what they do? Write this down. Behavioral scientists 
states that man's first interests are, write this down, number one, water. Maslow say the first human need is for liquid. Well, that's true because your body is 78 to 80% liquid. You think your body is a bunch of dirt, but it's more liquid than dirt. That's why when you cremate a person, you can put them in a soda can. Because most of your body is water. And if you're going to live, you've got to live on what you are. And you are water. And the rest of it is dirt. That's why you need to drink a lot of water. And some of you are sick today because you didn't drink a lot of water. When you feel a headache, don't take a pill. Just drink water. Because 90% of your headaches, listen to me, are dehydration. Some of your blood conditions, low blood pressure, not drinking enough water. Are you tired? You're tired because your body is starving from water, not food. Why do you think God put more water on the earth than land? Two-thirds of the earth's surface is water. Because God knew he made us out of water. And when the sun takes the ocean and evaporates it and it comes back down on the land in fresh rain, he is constantly feeding you 80% of what you're made out of. So when you go home, just drink some water. Matter of fact, before you even go home, stop by the, the pumps and drink some water. It's the part of health. So Maslow says man needs water. Drink. Number two, his second, and by the way, he said these are in order. Okay, he's putting these in order of importance. He said the first, the first thing first for man is water. The second is food. In other words, most humans, when they wake up in the morning, they are working for water and food. That's the first thought. Now, this is scientific research of millions of humans' behaviors. And you're sitting next to one. And he says the third need every human goes after is covering clothing they want to protect themselves sometimes it's not clothing in the sense that we know about it sometimes it means the third one and that is housing that's a covering because you see some tribes if you study it in the Amazon they don't wear clothes but they live in a, in a, in, in a hut because they have to be protected from the elements so covering is not just physical clothes it is also house every tribe in in any remote area of the world, they all have places that they live in. They may not have clothing on, but they take the bush and they make a covering. Because every human being needs to feel that they are covered. And the fifth need, he says, is protection. That all human beings are motivated by the need to be protected. That's their need. They want to feel that they are protected. And so they get things to defend themselves. Housing is part of it. You put locks on your door, you put windows in this thing, and kind of, or you have spears and knives and stuff. In other words, humans got to feel safe. So their, their number one passion is water, then food, then clothing, covering, then protection. Then Maslow says the other one is security. They want to feel as if their future is protected. They want to feel secure. Humans need to feel that they are not in danger. That's why you buy life insurance. That's why you pay NIB. It's, it's a security need. That's why you buy health insurance. And if you don't have any, you feel naked right now. You don't feel secure because, you know, if something happens to you health-wise, you know that you put your whole family in danger. They probably got to mortgage the house to pay for your medical bills. It means you destroy your family with just one sickness so the need for security he said is very high by the way again I'm going in the order of priority the priority starts at the top it's water then he gets to the top of the list he says and the seventh need of human motivation is preservation to preserve yourself that means you want to have a sense of continuity that we can protect ourselves and have security so we can perpetrate our own selves, reproduce ourselves. We've got to feel safe and preserved. The last one, he says, is called self-actualization. This means to have a sense of importance. 
In other words, humans think last about significance. They think first about water and food. This is very serious. Maslow says, you and I are motivated every morning when we wake up not to feel important about ourselves, but just to eat. Maybe that's why people would break into your house and steal your food. Because they don't feel important. Food is important. <laughs> that's why they would go into a church and tie up a pastor. And steal the money from the people in the congregation. Because they don't feel significant. They want what the money could buy, which would be basic stuff. Maybe drugs. The flesh. Now, self-actualization, according to Maslow, is the last pursuit. Matter of fact, I put another word here, significance. He says the last thing humans seek for is significance. That's why a woman would sell her body in sex to buy bread for her children. Because she don't feel significant because bread is more important than her significance. Why would a mother make her daughter a prostitute in order to pay the bills and buy food? It's because her daughter is not significant. The food is more important. And this is happening in the Bahamas, in case you don't know. Religion is driven by needs, and man is driven by these needs. last one Matthew chapter 6 oh by the way I wanted to show you Maslow's list because I think you will notice that Maslow's list is completely opposite to the list of Jesus and yet Maslow says 99% of the 6.8 billion people on earth are driven by that list. Whether they are in India, Africa, South America, the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, or Europe. It doesn't matter. Asia. He says it doesn't matter. All humans, whether, whether they're working in a rice paddy in India, or a rice paddy in China, or they're working at a hotel in the Bahamas, or if they are working in the snow in Canada, he said they are all driven by the same list of needs. They're trying to get water and food, clothes and covering, protection, preservation, and then eventually they might make it to significance. Here comes Jesus. Let's read his list. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. You want to turn to that and read it with me? He begins by saying, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Selah. Do you know what I call this slide? What do I call this slide? Come on, pronounce it. Perverse priority. In other words, man has a perverted list. The fall of man has made food and water more important than the man. Oh, how have the mighty fallen? We would sell our dignity for a bowl of soup. Imagine people sleeping with the boss to get a raise. Imagine telling a lie to get a bonus. Imagine punching a clock and you're not present. Because you want to make sure you're Pay is not cut so you can buy more bread. We have made bread, water, more important than ourselves. Jesus begins, I tell you, do 
not worry about your life. Now, most of you sitting here going, what does he mean by life? So Jesus said, look, let me define what I mean by life because I know what you think life is. He says, you think life is a cupboard full of groceries, a bank account full of money, gasoline in your car's tank, and your rent paid up. There are people with all of that, and they are depressed. So they miss life. Do not worry about your life. What is life? Read with me. What you will eat, oh Lord. He's taking care of Maslow now. What you will drink, oh no. About your body, what you will wear. Protection, covering. He just wiped out the list. He said, first of all, Maslow got you all figured out. This is your priority. He said, but my priority is completely opposite. So if you're going to live in my kingdom, you turn Maslow upside down and start with significance. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, the reason why you are broke is because you are looking for money. This is deep, you know. He said, the reason why you ain't got nothing to drink is because you're looking for water. The reason why you have no food is because you keep looking for food. Write this down. Whatever you pursue avoids you. Maybe that's why you ain't married yet. Oops. I just thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> Jesus said, why do you worry about your life? And to him, he has defined what you consider life. Either you consider life food and clothes and drink. That's why you would get up in the morning and go in that traffic. Completely wrong priority. Read the next statement. He says, is not life more important than food? Now Maslow's in trouble. And the body more important than house and clothing? Well, obviously, Jesus is not a Bahamian. Because he don't know how we live in here. He said, look, is not life more? Is it more? Don't answer that question because you got to check what your priorities are to answer the question. What motivates you? Is not life more important than these things? Food and clothes and drink? It gets worse. I thought I would define worry for you. I did a little bit of research on the word in this text again because I wanted to give you a meaning. I write the word down, worry. Here's what it means. First, it means to be consumed in thought. That means all you think about, what I can eat next. Some of you are doing it right now. Pastor Miles, hurry up because I'm thinking. That's those who ain't fasting, of course. I told my wife last night in the kitchen, I said, you know, isn't it great? When you're fasting, you got a lot of time. Because do you know they've proven by scientific proof that eight hours a day is consumed by what you think about food? Eight hours. Every human thinks at least eight hours about food every day. In other words, while they're eating breakfast, they're planning what they're going to eat for lunch. And when they're eating lunch, they start planning and talking what they're going to eat for dinner. See, the whole thing is consumed. Worry is to be consumed in thought. What preoccupies your thought life is your worry. Number two, worry means first interest. What do you think about? 
Some people are consumed by business instead of prayer. So the first thing you wake up in the morning, they start making business calls instead of praying. Instead of quiet time with God, they go into board meetings. They go into you know, business events. Going to, God says, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And why are you doing business? Because you're trying to get bread. First concern is what worry is. Number two, number three, worry means mental preoccupation. What are you thinking about right now instead of listening to me? What do you think about while you're driving down the street by yourself? What do you think about when you're stuck in traffic? What, what, what fills your mind? That's what you're worrying about. Some of you are preoccupied with your health. You think about things in your body. You think about sickness. You think about what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, uh, you feel a little pain. Hope that ain't that. You know, this whole consumed by your mental bank is filled with whatever you're worried about. Christ says, humans do exactly what Maslow says. He knows it. He says, you are mentally preoccupied with food and water and clothes and rent payment. Worry also means, I like this one, it means <laughs> fretting. as a Bahamian preoccupation. Fretting. Fretting means that you spend your time thinking about things that won't happen. And they actually immobilize you. It's worry. Worry is demonic. Worry is one of the greatest curses in your life. Because worry can never help you. Never help you. Worry changes nothing except your blood pressure. It's a killer. The scientific medical world calls worry another word. Stress. Your heart is skipping a beat because of stress. I read an article in Newsweek magazine two weeks ago, and they were talking about heart problems and, and diabetes and high blood pressure and all this stuff. Big article. And they, the conclusion article was that, that all of these are a result of constricting arteries. That means the muscles in the arteries are under stress, and so they tighten, they turn small. And they squeeze the blood, you know, like squeezing a hose. And so, the, so the blood have to put pressure going through, and the pressure of the blood backs up in the heart, and you get a heart attack. Stress is what constricts the arteries, they say. That means food is killing you. Not the one you're eating, the one you're worrying about. Hallelujah. Jesus was telling you in this statement, do not kill thyself. <laughs> when he said, do not worry, he was saying, do not kill thyself. Some of you don't need no one to murder you. You're doing a good job all by yourself. By worry. Stress. Another definition I thought was important. Worry means fear of the unknown. Remember in this same chapter we read next week, please don't miss next week, but he talks in the end of this chapter, he says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough problems of its own. In other words, stop worrying about unknown things. Some of you think that, that they're going to repossess your car tomorrow. Some of you think you're going to lose your apartment tomorrow because the rent is three months behind. Some of you are thinking that you're going to be dispelled from your job because they, they're discussing downsizing. Some of you think that there might be a fire that burn your house down tomorrow. So you got buckets all around the yard just in case. In other words, we, he says, look, do not worry about tomorrow. Worry means you are afraid of the unknown and you make the unknown today. You bring tomorrow into today. He said, don't do that. That's going to cause you stress.
I love this one. Worry means to rehearse the future. <laughs> Suppose this happened. Suppose that happened. But then I can do that. And then if he does, then I can do that. See? And by the time you finish for two hours, you've been discussing something that ain't never going to happen. <laughs> Some of you in this room got growths in your body from blood vessels that pop. Because you were stressed out on something that ain't deserved being thought about. And that tumor is the size right now of the pin needle, head of a pin needle. And it's growing. And God has sent this series and this message to deliver you from that little lump that you can't even see yet. So it goes away because your stress is taken away. Because he frees you from worry. worry fretting about the future the last definition I thought was very interesting worry means thought priorities in other words what are the priorities in your thoughts that's what your worry is you would be amazed what people worry about I met a lady one time on the airplane and she was sitting next to me first class man yeah, I figured everybody in first class that sense <laughs> And she's sitting there and she was crying wiping her eyes crying and I'm thinking now somebody died you know maybe she's going to a funeral you know it means real I mean, I'm thinking about reasonable things so I asked I said are you okay ma'am <laughs> yes uh, I guess I'll make it I said ma'am uh, what's the situation <laughs> my dog is home by himself <laughs> I said, <clears throat> thank you, ma'am. I read my magazine. <laughs> Good Lord. I mean, she is upset for a two-hour flight on a dog who don't even know she's thinking about him. He barking, wagging his tail, and she dying in the airplane. Let me tell you something I learned about life. Half of the people you worrying about ain't thinking about you. Tell your neighbor, get rid of it. Get rid of that stuff. Some of you got jilted and you still upset 10 years later. Every time you see the person, you're mad. And they're unmarried, you know? You need deliverance, man. Stress. It will kill you. It will kill you. High blood pressure. So worry means that your thoughts are full of things that you can't change. Look at the next verse, actually. We're going to look at this and close. We're going to pick up here next week. Matthew 6, 26 says, Look at the birds. Jesus speaking. Look at at the birds he said if you want to stop worrying study the birds they do not sow that means they don't farm they do not store away in barns that means they don't you know start a business to try and stock up a warehouse to sell stuff they do not work the way you work he says and yet your, he didn't say they, you know, your heavenly father feeds them. I think it might be important here to write in your notes the word father. Father. Everybody say father. The word father, write the meaning of it, is the Hebrew word Abba. A B A or A B B A, depending on your school of thought. The word Abba has a meaning. It means, write it down, source. S-O-U-R-C-E. Source. It also means sustainer. Sustainer. So when you read that word, you got to put all that in there. Be like the birds. Look at the birds. He says, for your source and your sustainer sustains them. 
Do you know why we are stressed out? We believe that our business or our jobs are our source. And therefore, if our business falls a little bit, we're going to be in trouble, we think. Or if we lose our jobs, we are really in trouble. So they have become our source. So pastor says, we're going to have a prayer meeting tomorrow night. And you think, I got to go do my business. And God is saying, <clears throat> uh, so, who is your father? Who is your Abba? And if you fool with God, he'll touch your business. Oh, friends. I become nervous when people start making their private interests more important than God's interests. Because in one day, God will wipe you out. Everybody say priority. He said, um, he said I want you to look at the birds. They're your source. Feeds them. Let's do it again. Your source. Now you broke, you know. Your source feeds them. You hungry, you know. He says, but your source feeds them. I mean, you the one who got trouble trying to pay bills, you know. He said, but your source feeds them. Which means your source ain't feeding you. Because there's something the bird's doing that you're not doing. Study the birds. He says, if he feeds them, are you not much more valuable than they? And then I like the way he closes this little piece. He says, who of you, warrior, can add an hour to his life? In one translation it says, an inch to his height. The only thing worry is good for is not worrying. 